A shorter tackle the big issues affecting the BVI and the rest of the Caribbean. Searches for answers to today's big questions and gives viewers a unique perspective on developing stories. Follow the big story with me, Kathy Richards, only on GTV. This show is brought to you by the National Bank of the Virgin Islands and Digicel, Cyril B. Romney Tartola, Pier Park and Agico Insurances, Banco Popular, Simply Secure, and NV Salon, Spa, Nail, and Barbershops. Dance is more than just physical movement. It's a tool through which students of all ages hone their confidence, creativity, self-expression, and shine bright at the Adagio Dance School. Our success is built on the quality of our instruction. We offer four levels of ballet, ranging from preschool to junior, where students learn the proper techniques to perform pieces of this traditional style of dance effortlessly. Each of these classes further boosts physical, mental, and emotional well-being and adds a little more enjoyment to your child's everyday life. Adagio also offers more contemporary classes like Afrobeats and Hip Hop. Acrobatics presents limitless benefits like strength building, flexibility, and hand and eye coordination. Students are encouraged to support each other throughout the training process and build on what they've learned. Our teachers are there every step of the way, skillfully guiding and supervising movements to improve balance and agility without causing injury. Preschool and primary students are given extra attention as they develop their coordination. For some extra flair, students can enroll in our majorettes classes. Conditioning and flexibility takes all their movements to the next level. In light of COVID-19, we've implemented strict safety measures in our spacious studio to ensure students get the most out of our classes without compromising their health or the health of their loved ones. Come find your rhythm at the Adagio Dance School. Call or send us an email today to learn more about our classes. Stop. 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 Think. Think. Before you act. Before you act. Think before you act. Welcome to this edition of The Big Story. I'm Cassie Richards. I want to thank you so much for joining us. We are out on the beautiful island of Yas Van Dyke. Yes, wherever we find the opportunity to sit and talk, we will. And so today we are with, I'm going to shorten this portfolio today, <laughs> to, to being the Minister for Education, the Deputy, Deputy Premier, Dr. The Honorable Natalio Sowande Weekly. I always put that Sowande in there because it's a name that you... You rever and you you don't mind persons calling you, uh, Minister. It's, it's a pleasure to be sitting here with you this afternoon here on uh, Yas Van Dyke, and you came over for the reason of progressing a situation that has been in existence for quite a long time, and finally it's getting off the ground. Yes, it's really a a, a good day for the people of Yas Van Dyke uh, because, of course, we have approved designs. Uh, from town and country planning for the new Jasper Van Dyke Primary School. Now, the persons here in Jasper Van Dyke have been without a school since 2017 when the hurricane basically destroyed their school. And they have been in makeshift arrangements which are not adequate um, for anyone here in the Virgin Islands and that we have to rectify as quickly as possible. Of course, it hasn't happened as quickly as I would have liked, but I'm glad that we have some progress now. We are ready to move to the procurement stage, um, to award a tender, and hopefully we can get um, this project finished on time and on budget as quickly as possible. Uh, I recall being over here once when uh, there was a community meeting where uh, residents had indicated they do not wish for the school to be constructed on the flats, but rather uh, in the hills. And you did at the time promise that you guys were going to explore all possibilities. And what I've heard is that you are moving to the hills. And tell us how that happened. Well, of course, as a ministry, we have to do our due diligence, uh, which is, of course, we have to see how much it would cost to be on the hill, how much it would cost to be on the flat, or whether some of the issues on the flat could be rectified. So we went through our whole uh, due diligence, of course, when you build on the hill, it's a little more expensive. 
Um, but when we took a look at the cost of building on the flat and fixing the drainage, it wasn't that far off. So we decided, of course, that we had to go on, on the hill. And the most important factor was the people of the community wanted the school on the hill, and we wanted to make sure that we you know, give the people what they want once it's within our means. Okay, and it, was, it, it was within our means and we could make it happen. How soon do we, do we to expect the school, the school to be completed? Uh, our technical persons tell us 18 months, mm -hmm. um, but we would like to see if we could do it as quickly as possible. So I'm going to be proud of them and pushing them to see if we can do it below the 18 months. Okay, so we're looking probably for the 2022-2023 the 20, academic school year, somewhere around there? Somewhere within that school year, yes. Okay, beautiful. All right, how much this project is costing? We wouldn't know at this time? Oh, after they go to tender, we'll have an idea of the cost of the project. You know, we certainly want to go for um, the bidder that gives us the best value for money. So we're hoping that it's not too much, but we have millions of dollars already allocated to this project. Okay, great to hear. Let's segue now into the bigger picture of education. And we know that we, we would have heard from you the announcement that uh, it's back to person-to-person -person school sessions come the 6th of September. And while we have some people who are happy, we have some people who are not so happy, but we have some people still not too sure as to how that process is going to evolve now that we've been uh, virtual for quite some time and now going back into a full setting or oh, a late affairs well of course we know what the situation is around the world and in the Virgin Islands we have COVID-19 pandemic uh, we had uh, not too long ago about 1600 cases in a very short period of time um, I think we should applaud our health officials the HEOC team who has led us back to a, a place where we're under 40, I think we may be under 30 right now cases, which I think is something that's very good because most times persons get up to 1,600 cases and it spirals out of control. And that could have not have been done without the adherence to the great majority of the public to our health protocols and to persons isolating and social distancing, sanitizing, uh, et cetera. And of course, we had many persons who were able to get vaccinated. And we saw, especially during this um, spike that we had, the importance of being vaccinated. So we're grateful for that. But of course, we recognize over the past, uh, I guess, 16 months or so of going through um, COVID in our schools, that while the online system gave us some continuity and some persons were able to thrive in it, of course, I have children in the system, so I can speak to this directly. Some children were, were able to thrive. And in fact, I looked at the grades um, from all of the school leavers. And in, in one school, you had maybe 31 out of the 34 students having honors. So we were able to make it through the school year uh, with persons um, being able to complete their education uh, some persons were able to do pretty well. Uh, but, of course, we had some of those persons who did not do as well, um, and some of them point to the online system. And we can see how that can be the case, because, of course, in some instances, you don't have as much supervision. Um, the children can become distracted at home, especially if they don't have someone walking with them. And some of them just thrive better in the classroom environment. Mm. So we wanted to make sure that every student had the opportunity to come into our schools. And research around the world tells us that um, the protocols in the schools matter. If you have that three foot distancing in the schools, um, children wear their masks. Of course, if any, we don't send children to school who exhibit any symptoms of sickness, um, we're able to isolate persons who exhibit any any sickness at all. It's something that we can do. And of course, uh, you know, we have to be able to anticipate having a case in the school at some point that we have protocols in place um, if we ever are encountered with a case within the schools. And we have to get used to Kathy to having COVID-19 because it's not going anywhere anytime soon. It's, it's going to be like the, the cold or the flu. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have to make sure we develop some immunity to it. And while we have a 
a naive um, immune system like we do right now, which has not been introduced to the virus, we have to see how, how we can get persons immunized and how we can get persons to, be, um, to prevent themselves from getting it. Okay. Uh, one of the discussions that we are hearing that is prevalent right now is probably, I think it's stem up off of what persons would have read in uh, the, the media and what I would have heard you alluded to in the House of Assembly is that of uh, some, some problems within some schools. The, the infrastructure of some schools, there are existing problems. Uh, could, you, could you talk a little bit on those problems and what are the measures in place to deal with those problems and then we'll come to the other, the other topic. Uh, we definitely have a lot of infrastructural issues in schools and in some instances that infrastructure has been neglected and of course you have the issues from the storm etc. We've tried as a government to address infrastructural issues as resources would allow. So last year for instance, last academic school year, I would have signed contracts for over um, $300,000 to rectify issues in our schools. We had we fixed roofs at Ebenezer Thomas, at Alexandrina Maduro. We had two roofs we fixed at Ivan Dawson. Ivan Dawson, which is going to be ready to open this school year, which we, we, which we give God thanks for. We did some work at Virgin Islands School of Technical Studies. We did a, 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 a great deal of work um, over the past school year based on the concerns of, of our principals, our teachers, and our students, we were able to do some mold remediation at places that had some big problems with mold, like Alexandrina, Maduro, Leonora Delville, Ivan Dawson. And that's going to be ongoing. Uh, certainly, the Premier has promised me that he'll be supportive in terms of getting some more funds for maintenance to deal with some of the issues that our principals, our teachers, and our students are dealing with. The majority of those those issues will be rectified by September 6th? We're trying our best, but the school is a place that always has problems. Yeah, understood. You're never going to be able to rectify every single problem, but of course we're very sensitive to the concerns that exist about mold. And I don't want to hear about any mold problems, so I'm putting a lot of resources towards mold. We're having some evaluations of some of the priorities in the schools some things that must get done before um, schools open, and some of the other things will be ongoing throughout the school year. And the big question would be, uh, we know that at some stage we would have to return to classrooms. Uh, how soon, it, how long ago it was that we started prioritizing, especially that issue of mold? Okay, well we've been doing mold, as I said, from you know acad last academic school year, and not, not too long ago we just did some more clean at Ivan Dawson Primary School. And we're about to do some at Leonora Delville Primary School before the opening of the school. Yeah, and some other places like Francis Letson and places like that. So it's been a priority. But what we want to do now is to make sure in this upcoming budget that we actually have a line item for mold remediation, which we haven't had before, so that we can have mold cleaning on an ongoing basis. You don't wait for it to get to the point where it's causing a lot of challenges. It's being done regularly and it's, it will be less of a problem if it's done regularly. The hot topic, uh, the number of teachers that will be or would have left the system over the past year. Yes, um, well I'm glad that you brought it up Kathy because it was a question asked in the House of Assembly. Actually those questions were a bit old and a bit dated um, but I responded to them anyway. Um, but persons should know that every school year there's a certain amount of turnover that you have in the school system. You have persons who retire, you have persons who go on maternity leave, you have persons who go on study leave, and you have persons who may change careers for whatever particular reason. Um, so it's nothing out of the ordinary for us to be filling positions. Every summer, the Teaching Service Commission is doing interviews to fill positions. And many of those positions would have been filled already. But I have to say to you, Kathy, uh, teaching is always an area that requires persons to walk. You know, it's a place where you can really always have employment opportunities, similar to like nursing and things like that. So persons, if they're interested in becoming teachers, we're providing an avenue for them by restarting the uh, teacher education program 
and the college. Uh, for whatever reason, the last administration stopped the program. But if you're serious about your education system, you must always have a teacher education um, program going, that young people who go to school, they have an ambition to be a teacher, they have the means of becoming trained. So we're restarting a teacher education program at the college that will provide a dedicated source of teachers for the system and to help to upgrade the skills of the existing teachers in the system. Okay. Uh, there seems to be some bit of discomfort among the, the teacher population of itself. Uh, not to tell you a lie, I've been hearing and uh, seeing uh, certain communications which indicate that teachers want to go to the extent of, of striking, uh, protesting uh, for, for reasons that I don't know many of, uh, but one of the things that I'm hearing is that of increment size of classes, uh, teachers having to constantly come out of their, their pockets to uh, do, buy purchase supplies to make sure that they do their jobs effectively. There are teachers who have to be uh, providing meals for children who would come hungry and they cannot just sit and watch kids. They are hungry and they're not, and they have a very meager salary, but yet they commit what they learn, they earn towards uh, these things. And uh, uh, they feel strongly that at this time, this should stop. Well, let me say to you, Kathy, I met with the teachers union and I heard the cries of the teachers. In fact, I've been meeting with the teacher union regularly. Um, whenever they have a meeting, I'm invited, and I always attend, or I try my very best to attend their meetings. And as a result of the meetings, we've had some progress. Some of the more cleaning and things that we've done were as a result of meeting with the teachers. And let me say to you, I hear the cries of the teachers. I, you know, if they're saying teachers' lives matter, I, I'll wear the t-shirt. Yeah, that, I saw I saw that going around. They're asking persons teachers to, put, lives to put up that on matter. the status. Teachers I agree matter. with it. I'm, I'll match with the teachers as well. I am an advocate for better conditions for teachers, for better pay for teachers. Uh, of course, this administration met a lot of these problems. These are long-standing problems over a number, a number of years. Now, when my grandfather was a headmaster in the system, I would say teaching was an esteemed and revered profession. It still is. And and a lot of your best and your brightest persons would become teachers. It was considered to be a good job. Somewhere along the line, um, our school system um, grew. Uh, we, have, we didn't invest as much in our education system as we needed to. And it's left to persons who are in authority right now, which, which would happen to be Virgin Islands Party administration to fix it. And we have been putting um, putting things in place to fix the challenges. These challenges are not overnight fixes, I have to say to you. But it's not lip service. Some persons are saying you're just paying lip service. We have shown um, throughout being in office thus far that we're willing to back up our talk with action. I'll give you a few examples, Kathy. As soon as we came in, we spent four, close to $4 million refurbishing what is now known as the L Adarity Tongo building. We also spent about a quarter of a million dollars on uh, improving the facilities at the Clarence Thomas building, which is we did, our administration didn't put the students in the Cyrus Thomas building. But I have to tell you, Kathy, we'll take them out of the Clarence Thomas building because we're gonna build new structures at MSL High School to take our teachers and students out of those very poor conditions. Brigado Flax, just finished being refurbished. We spent close to $2 million doing that. Also, before um, that building was finished at Brigado Flax, we had um, a tent there, and we spent a lot of money, about $134,000 upgrading facilities in that tent. Now, has enough been done for our teachers? No, enough has not been done. There's way more to be done, but we are committed to doing the work. And you speak about increments. This government came into office and we almost immediately paid increments for 2016, which were outstanding. And, I, and we also approved increments for 2017. And I'm committed to see those increments being paid, of course, along with the team, the Premier, Minister of Finance, and the team. We're committed to getting those increments paid. And also, 
um, the issue of teachers having to spend their own money on resources, that's something I take very seriously, and I'm gonna get together with the Minister of Finance and see how we can get that problem solved. Help me to understand, uh, if you have been meeting uh, regularly or whenever they meet with the teachers uh, union, that's what you call it, the teachers service commission or the teachers union? Teachers union. The teachers union. How it is that they are to the stage now of wanting to do a protest? Well, the teachers union, in my view, has not expressed any interest in doing a protest, the teachers union itself. I've been in discussions and negotiations with the teachers union and we have a follow-up meeting plan. We actually have a meeting um, on Sunday plan, which is today, um, to be able to meet with, with the teachers union. And we had a follow-up meeting on, on August 31st. Um, and the teachers union has not expressed to me um, plans to protest. But I know there are other teachers who have been spreading a message about protests, but the teachers union itself, we're in negotiations with the teachers union, and we hope to be able to meet some of their demands. Okay, uh, what what are some of those demands that you know for a fact that they are going to be coming to you with? Well, um, the increments, you mentioned some of them. Yeah. Um, the resources, being able to work in better conditions. Smaller, smaller class size? That one hasn't come to me. But I myself, I, I believe in smaller class sizes for teachers. And that's going to require having more teachers, having more space. And of course, as you know, we have big plans for building more schools. And I would like to see us dedicate more money into hiring more teachers. But Kathy, we have to as well be realistic and um, be uh, honest about it. Um, the government is going to have to make more money as well. So while we're making plans to reduce class sizes and to pay teachers more, we're going to need to make more revenue as a territory. That's why I'm pleased that the Minister of Finance and the VIP administration um, in the House of Assembly we're looking at this investment bill, uh, the BBI Investment Act, and we want to attract more investment to the BBI, whether from inside or outside. And we have um, new revenue measures that we've been proposing, you're familiar with some of them, like legalizing, for instance, um, gaming. And of course, we had the, the medicinal cannabis that was supposed to bring in us in more revenue, which has been frustrated by the United Kingdom's mm, okay. government. Okay. Uh, I, you've made the call for persons who, who are not quite comfortable with in school person-to-person -person, uh, sessions at the moment probably whether or not it is that they are vaccinated or not, but you've made that call in your in your uh, statement to the territory. How has the response been? Are you seeing quite a number of persons coming forward wishing to continue uh, virtual learning sessions? I, I know of a, a few persons who have expressed that, uh, but what we did as a ministry is we created a survey, so we don't have to go off a of word of mouth. Uh, we have a survey where we can actually have the statistics and this coming week, I expect to, to see what the response has been thus far. I haven't asked for the results as yet because I wanted to give persons a little more time so we can have accurate statistics of how many persons would prefer online um, option. And I'll present those statistics to the public. And of course, with substantial numbers, we can put uh, something in place. Great. Uh, Minister, I wouldn't take much more of your time. Uh, we're borrowing space here at Foxy's, and uh, persons are beginning to come in for dinner, so we don't want to keep them too hushed up just to facilitate us here. But I thought it was a great discussion, uh, uh, a great discussion, and I'm looking forward to it even more as, as we progress closer to September 6th. Yes, I would like to um, speak with the media more. Um, Kathy, thank you for the work you're doing in keeping the public informed. It's important for us to keep the public involved, and that's where the media comes in. So I want to have much more engagement with the media so we can let persons know the facts about the education system and other areas in my ministry. Okay, and I want to thank you for taking time out to be part of this discussion. Uh, I'm Kathy Richards. Thank you so much for joining us.